All right, I think we should be rolling here. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is uh, uh, Business Law. It's titled Introduction to Law, this first chapter, and uh, it'll be broken into two parts. So uh, we'll go through roughly the first half of the PowerPoint here, and then the uh, second half will be in part two, uh, provided for you in integrity lecture as well. So um, basically, we're overall, the idea of the background of the nature of law and getting at critical legal thinking, we'll look at that as well. And uh, that's what our chapter is about. So here we go. All right, um, I'm just going to put this whole slide up here. Um, pardon me, let me get everything, click everything off here. Um, I've often had uh, friends uh, say this to me, or even students will say this, and they basically say, oh, the law doesn't really impact me much, and I'll kind of um, shake my head a little bit, and then I go through this slide, and we'll talk about an average day and, and explain how the law does impact all of us. So um, many of you are probably already just aware of this and uh, don't even think twice about it, but I think if you just woke up and you're, um, uh, you know, reach over on your nightstand, grab a glass of water, um, uh, you know, flip on your lights, uh, this part of your day as you're just getting up, um, your water, your electricity, uh, your phone, if you have your cell phone there, just the, the water you have, uh, what comes out of your, your pipe, um, your faucet, uh, it, it will dramatically, dramatically be shaped by the law that's required in wherever you live, um, whatever the jurisdiction is, and we have federal and state law that, that uh, regulates what can't and, uh, can and can't be in your, your water. So uh, a regulatory um, law, uh, a, a, um, an administrative law has been passed that uh, regulates what's in terms of your, your water quality. And uh, your electricity, if you have electricity, um, the fact that you, we look at this typically, we often in our culture in America, we, we say that uh, monopolies are bad, and uh, and yet you don't have many options as to who you pay your electric bill to typically. So in this case, we collectively as a society have said that law should be passed that enables uh, a monopoly to control our utility. So you can uh, regulate, um, uh, and, and the idea is to keep the, the price of electricity relatively stable for people, and so uh, we do allow for monopoly, one company, to uh, basically control the market for your electricity. Of course, you have options if you decide you want to have your own solar panels and uh, run off the grid, that, that's an option for people, but uh, typically uh, you normally pay into your, your, your bill goes to your local um, utility. Uh, so the law has impacted you there. If you have a cell phone or if you have a landline, again, there are cell phone companies um, in some areas too that uh, have worked out deals where they have uh, monopolies or uh, a few companies will service certain areas and they, they divvy up those areas as to um, whether, they do, whether they can uh, run their business that way. Um, uh, but uh, again, there's law that regulates uh, a lot of communications law that, that regulates uh, how that industry functions on cell phone um, billing and, and all sorts of uh, companies that you can choose from in, a, in your local area. Um, again, that's uh, divvied up by, by um, the businesses by way of regulatory uh, law that allows for that in certain areas. If you go out to your kitchen and then get some coffee or some orange juice, you have some toast, you start eating a day again here. Uh, it has to come from overseas, and uh, we have, uh, when it gets to the, the border, we have export control folks who take a look at it, and uh, be sure to use the only thing illegal that's coming with it. And um, uh, uh, import duties that, that uh, companies pay to be able to import that product into the country. Uh, you have some juice, and we, we grade agriculturally, we have differences, and uh, often those oranges may be coming from, uh, to make up the orange juice, might be coming from Brazil or um, some other country, and, uh, and so again, you'll uh, have law that impacts that. Your toast, uh, again, we have administrative and regulatory laws that impact uh, the wheat and uh, the labeling, is it organic or is it not? Uh, and what is, how do you define the word organic? Uh, there's legal definitions of, of, of that. Um, and if you're going to market your, your product as, as uh, organic bread. So here you're barely even out of your kitchen and uh, the laws impacted you on, 
all these things. You're not even dressed yet, but um, you uh, live in a home. You have a, um, a mortgage you may be paying unless your house has been paid off. Uh, if you are renting, uh, renting a home or an apartment, then you have a lease. And even if you don't have a lease, then there is a law that protects you, landlord-tenant law. Even without a lease, you can be protected. So uh, the law has impacted you. So finally, you step out of your home or apartment, and you step into the air. And again, there's state and federal law re regulating the air quality that uh, you uh, will be breathing in or not, um, uh, you know, what, what the quality of that air is, um, how you get to the college if you're coming here to Shoreline Community College or you get to your job. Uh, is there a bus that's available f for you? Uh, do you have a car? Um, is there a bicycle uh, that you have? Is there a bicycle lane? Um, all these have regulations that impact them uh, from the fuel that you put in your car or that's in the bus. Uh, we have um, taxes that uh, are attributed for the fuel. and um, we have all sorts of regulations about who can drive a bus, who can drive a car, and uh, whether you have to wear a seat. Uh, if you're on a bicycle, some areas require you to have a helmet. Other places do not. Uh, and there's law about those types of things. Um, if you have a motorcycle, same kind of issue. And uh, so here, you're, you haven't gotten to school, but now you are finally at the college. And um, what classes you take, if you have to take this, it's a required class. Who's decided that? Um, we've dratively an administrative law was passed that, that enabled Shoreline Community College to exist and uh, in agreement with other colleges and universities in the state for transfer in particular this business to a one class um, is a required class. Uh, we used to have a um, cosmetic uh, school here and beautician. Um, cosmetology, cosmetology, I should say, school as part of the college uh, is no longer with the college, but um, for people who are going to um, do a perm in somebody's hair and using chemicals, we would have to, they have to have special certification. Uh, people who are in our dental hygiene school have to have special certification um, to be for safety and health reasons, to be fooling around with your mouth. All these things, again, uh, here again while you're at school are all regulatory and, and legal in nature. And even if you go back to sleep and go home, um, again, people will say, well, the law doesn't impact me then. And it's like, well, yes, we have the, the military who are out uh, defending us, um, and we have taxes that we pay to um, help uh, help do that. We have police, fire departments, and uh, the various areas we're in. And again, so even while you're sleeping, the law is impacting you. So my take would be, again, just to suggest that Obviously, the law is all around us, and so we need to need to be paying attention. Um, it, it behooves us to sort of analyze it. In particular, this class is dealing with the law and business, and so um, business doesn't uh, operate in a vacuum. So it uh, it obviously too uh, has to uh, um, look at uh, or be involved in a lot of these uh, aspects of how the law operates, and so um, we'll be looking at that all quarter. So I kind of uh, that slide to just argue that, it, that the law is all around you all the time, I uh, then go to this slide and ask a question often in class, in my face-to-face -face classes, we get to this and really kind of analyze it in depth. But I, I basically say that this one slide um, uh, suggests what your whole textbook is going to be talking about all quarter long. And I don't know if, I, if it's on here, hold on one second, I'm going to click this and see, yeah. Um, and it's these two magic words. Uh, competing interests. So we talk about this in class. Obviously, since I'm doing this as a integrity lecture, I'm talking at you instead of ha having the dynamic of us go back and forth. But typically, what I would ask is, you know, what interests are at stake here? And um, this one slide basically tells you what our whole textbook is about all quarter long, competing interests. And um, uh, in the law, uh, often this is what we're, we're getting at. Uh, you're, if you look at most of the well, all the cases that we have, you'll generally see the little letter V um, period between two parties' names, and that means versus. It means that there's something, one party against another uh, in regards to their concept of what they think the law is, that their rights have been harmed somehow. So this slide, I suggest, uh, tells you a lot if you want to look at it. Um, one area of competing interests would be to say, if you're a cigarette company, what would you want to do? You want to sell as many of these cigarettes as you can. You have a First Amendment right uh, under our Constitution to uh, promote with advertising to try to sell your product. And uh, so you should sell those. You have a, a property interest right to be able to, to earn as much money and profit as you can as a company. And and yet, you need to do that. Uh, the competing interest here is to do that ethically. So how do you advertise? Do you do something like a, a number of years ago, we had the um, 
issue with Camel Cigarettes when they had this Joe Cool uh, Camel, sort of cartoon Camel uh, character that was being used in advertising. And the suggestion was that, uh, that you, um, you know, try to, trying to get kids to be interested in, in smoking. And the earlier you would, would smoke, the, since there's nicotine in this product, people would get hooked and, uh, and uh, you'd have long-term sales by doing that. The question is whether you should be able to advertise in that way that um, kind of promotes this uh, idea to, to kids and, um, and um, how high uh, in the store should uh, cigarette advertising be. So if you go into a 7-Eleven, the argument is uh, uh, advertising for, for something like cigarettes shouldn't be down low where kids would see it and uh, pr to promote that. So there's an issue even though the company wants to sell as much as it can. It's an issue is on the other side, the, the um, health aspects for um, families with kids and um, the ethical aspects of of who um, their target market is in this case. Um, another competing interest here would be smokers. Smokers have a right to smoke. If they don't want to smoke uh, as many of these cigarettes as they can, they should be able to smoke. It's their body, um, it's their lungs, it's their money that they're paying for for, for this product that they should be able to, to do as they wish. Um, on the flip side of that, you have people who don't want to breathe in the secondhand smoke, and so there's been a big dispute. Um, wasn't too long ago in the state of Washington where um, law was passed that, um, and a lot of businesses were upset about this. Pubs and and that were upset when they said that all these types of um, facilities open to the public, restaurants and pubs couldn't have uh, smoking in them because of the secondhand smoke issue. You had a lot of smokers who were upset. You had a lot of business owners who were upset because they thought they would lose a lot of business. Um, and uh, look at our campus. We have designated areas for smokers, uh, where people are supposed to smoke on campus, and they can't walk anywhere and smoke where they want. So, is that a limit on their freedom? Absolutely. Um, and then the flip side is people who don't want this um, to breathe this in have that argument as well. So, we have obviously a competing interest there. Um, States uh, are another competing interest here. States want the tax money from this. Uh, states uh, claim that they're opposed to smoking and want to protect our health, and that's the reason for doing this, but there's tax revenue involved, and um, states um, benefit from the tax revenue when we sell alcohol and cigarettes, as an example. Um, so states have the, the interest of trying to keep people healthy. They also have the interest of um, generating tax revenue to help teach people about not smoking and not drinking to access those types of things. Uh, question here on the competing interests is, do states then have a duty to protect minors from cigarettes and alcohol? And, and uh, uh, some would say yes, and some say no. It's not the state's job. It's uh, parents' and individuals' job to, to do that. Um, a competing interest here, too, can be businesses. Uh, businesses have shown to lose a lot of uh, productivity when people are sick because they smoke a lot. And so can a business make a requirement to hire you as a, only a non-smoker, or are they discriminating against people who are smokers then? If they believe and have some data to prove from their standpoint that they're going to um, have more sick days and that our people are out and not productive, um, it might be uh, in a business interest to discriminate. And then we have an issue, um, uh, issue there, obviously, too. Um, so, again, multiple competing interests, and that's what this class is about, ultimately. It's a big portion of, of what we'll end up talking about, and um, moving into the next slide here. So, um, here we're going to get just defining the law and what it is, and a very basic definition would be just this, this idea of, of setting some type of guidelines that society would want, um, general set of guidelines for for um, for. Uh, uh, society and uh, how people should live, right? So I say, if this is a guidelines for society that are set by government, if that's our definition, I say, what if um, I say this? All students who eat okra, or if you like okra, how about Brussels sprouts, in this class get a 4.0 and ask, is that a law? And often I would get a lot of funny faces because people don't like broccoli or Brussels sprouts or okra, and they say, well, that's not okay. And, and um, so uh, if, if we're using that definition, uh, guidelines for society, if I say our, our class is the society, um, I'm essentially government, uh, would that be a law? And um, it's arguable. Uh, if, if I did this, it, it, it's uh, unlikely that that would last. Um, I, I would last in my position too long. Um, but, uh, I mean, you might. how do you even enforce it, even if it were a law? 
uh, very difficult to, to prove that you ate your, your okra or Brussels sprouts unless you had some green stuff in your teeth and you arrived in class. I could see that. Um, <laughs> there'd be no real way to, to prove it otherwise. Um, and, and so enforcement would be one issue. Also, what about people who are allergic to those things? It would clearly discriminate against them and uh, not be fair in that sense. So we could uh, attack the the uh, uh, integrity of this kind of idea of what law would be. Uh, probably here's a, you know, from your textbook another definition, a little bit more straightforward and in a sense. Um, and it, it's looking at the same idea of having a, a sort of set of, of guidelines and rules for society, but uh, significantly adding this component of it that there's some binding legal force behind it. And even if I said my decree, my law is uh, that we have to have uh, Brussels sprouts or okra, um, I wouldn't have binding legal force behind me to uh, um, to have have you abide by that, um, you know, all you have to do is march over to the thousand building or make a phone call or email to someone there, and I wouldn't have a job. So clearly, that that rule from the last slide wouldn't be a, a law in that sense. So, all right. So add this to to your mix and the thought process here, and um, thinking about this. And so suppose here's a situation: anyone who yells fire in a crowded theater must pay a fine not to exceed five thousand dollars and or serve a term of imprisonment up to three months. What's that sound like? Does that sound like a law? And um, it's, it, it has uh, some teeth to it. There's a fine. There's some imprisonment if you do this. And um, so you might ask uh, what I often ask people to, to do is think of the, the two magic words of public policy. And public policy is sort of the um, the question, the why question. Why would this be a law? Why would, would government pass such a um, a thing that we would consider to be a law. And, and obviously here, if you yell fire in a crowded theater, people would be injured uh, when they'd run and try to, to get out. Uh, the, the, there, there might be some other issues here, though. And uh, it, it, if, it, what if you yell fire in a crowded theater and it was a fire? Um, you're still going to get a fine um, or go to jail, according to this thing called the law. And um, so there's some other, we talk about mitigating factors, which we'll talk about in the criminal law section here too. Are there some defenses essentially that you would have? And in this case, you would say, well, I yelled fire because there was actually a fire and I don't want people to get out. So um, should you be subject to that? So we would say that this uh, law is either vague or um, you know, inappropriately drafted because in certain circumstances, it shouldn't, shouldn't be valid. Um, so there's one, one way to look at that. Um, another aspect of this is what if you were mistaken somehow? Somebody, the light started to dim at the beginning of the movie, and you looked out at the end of the aisle, it looks like somebody's lighting a lighter or trying to set something on fire, and actually what they're doing is just flipping the phone and making. You know, people try to run out of the theater and they get hurt, and you were mistaken in the process. So this law might be a law, and <laughs> doesn't mean that laws are, are written that aren't vague or aren't. Um, uh, aren't good law. They, sometimes laws are written and they're poorly written and uh, are not applied in a way that is uh, good. So people can, um, can, can try to argue that even though it might be considered law in a technical sense, it might have some, some problems in application in that case. Um, <laughs> there was a, uh, see if I have this right, the city of Seattle uh, passed a law a while back too um, that, were, that was trying to, to uh, uh, dissuade uh, skateboarders in particular, people who would loiter um, uh, in front of certain businesses around their entries, entries in downtown Seattle. And, you know, businesses that complained to the city of Seattle and said, we had these people that just kind of hang out out in front of our place. And um, typically they were skateboarders and sometimes they might have been panhandlers, people were homeless. And, and uh, so the ordinance gets passed that, that said that people uh, couldn't loiter so many feet away from, from entryways. Um, so question then arises, there's a person who's, quotes professional and they're dressed and they're um, standing there waiting for a bus, but they're in front of someone's uh, entryway. Um, you know, how does that law apply? Uh, you know, uh, should it affect only the skateboarders or people who are homeless? Or what about people who are professional also? So here you can imagine, yes, the law is a law by definition, and in application is discriminatory, and uh, so we might uh, challenge challenge it in that sense. So these types of questions we'll be, again, addressing this quarter. So, 
All right, um, a couple more slides here, and then we'll get to the halfway point and, and uh, get into part two. But uh, here I'm uh, going to go through, I'll put this whole slide up here too for you guys. Um, let me get all this. Um, I often have this Monty Python clip that I play at this at this point, but um, I'm putting all the words on this slide. But uh, uh, I, my colleagues in the history department might be upset with me, but um, I... Uh, won't test you on specifics on dates or anything like that uh, here in this class. But what I do think is important for you to understand is sort of the, the historical background to our, our American legal system. And it comes primarily from the, the European, uh, particularly the, the English um, system. So looking back around before the 11th century, so before the year 1000 even, in the, the old uh, feudalistic period in England, um, you had competing tribes and things, the Angles and the Saxons, and uh, basically you had uh, a very, any of you have studied your, your uh, history there would know the, what, when we're talking about feudalism, we're talking about people who are serfs, people who are artisans, people who work the land, uh, they don't own the land, they um, uh, work for someone who is a lord, someone who owns land, who uh, has uh, been bequested that land from the king, uh, whoever's in charge, and uh, the lords control everything because they own the land, and the uh, rest of the populace, the serfs work in the fields, they work with the cattle, they, they make uh, you know leather, they make all sorts of things with their hands. Um, and so the very uh, primitive system that evolved through that time was based on, as it says here, unwritten local custom. Um, what would you do if you were in charge of, of the Lord's cattle and you fell asleep and the cattle grazed over on another Lord's land and ate a bunch of the crops there? Typically in those days, the, the Lord only cared about one thing at the end of the day, and that was that you paid your taxes. And you paid your taxes and uh, whatever it was that you, you grew, if you, you were supposed to harvest corn or wheat or something, or you were to make cheese or milk, then you had to produce so much of that to, to give over to the king so the king could then feed his army um, or, you know, and, and the, the lord could pay to, to keep knights to, to you know, fight and that sort of thing to protect that, that area that the, the lord owned or was responsible for. So all they cared about was getting taxes at the end of the day and they don't really care the story of why you fell asleep or what caused you to fall asleep or whatever that, but you were responsible for the cows. How would they solve this situation? They would look at what was a local custom? You go by how were cases that were like this, how were they decided before in the past? And uh, it led to a lot of very um, bizarre types of things, like you see this little, I normally have a clip for you, but this, this uh, Monty Python scene of um, how they claimed someone was a witch and how they would tell she was a witch. They had this elaborate, silly way that they did this. Um, uh, it sounds silly today, but these things like trial by ordeal and trial by morsel, um, uh, if they believe somebody was, uh, you know, guilty of something, they would they would say, okay, the trial by ordeal. Let's take this fiery metal piece of something and take it out of the fire and put it in your hands. Of course, it would burn you. And then, if it was infected after so many days, then you must be guilty, right? Or uh, throw you in a pond, uh, paddle you out in the middle of the pond and throw you in the pond. And if you you drown in the pool, the water, then you must have been guilty. Um, a lot of people obviously couldn't swim in those days. Um, if you did survive, then of course you, then you were innocent somehow. You know, uh, trial by morsel. It will give you something very really terrible to eat, and if you get sick, then you must be guilty. Uh, <laughs> these sound like very strange things, uh, but again. They were developed because we wanted to be consistent in how we would apply the idea of the law. And so we, whatever the case was, we look at how we decided other cases before. And that's the root of what we consider to be common law today. Uh, common law not written down based on custom. Okay, so this is prior to the year um, uh, 1000, 11th century. So out of this period, you get the things like uh, the term Shire Reeve, which, you know, the Shire was uh, the, the uh, area that was a, a, like a location within the, the Lord's property. And the reeve was supposed to go out and, and protect, uh, go over and, and be responsible for keeping the peace within the shire, that area. So shire reeve comes, our term sheriff today is derived from that, that term. Um, uh, ben and Jerry, I'm sure you're familiar with for ice cream, they used to call, a, a, had a term called tithing back in those days. And a tithing, um, the idea was, uh, like Ben and Jerry today, uh, it, what you had if, if um, 
two people had a business together, um, and uh, uh, one couldn't afford the debt, uh, or if they couldn't, they had, the business had a debt, uh, both were responsible for it. If one couldn't pay the debt, then the other one was responsible for it. Uh, today, we have that sort of notion with uh, with partnership law. Uh, ben and Jerry have a partnership, and if Ben owes a debt that's on behalf of the company, if he can't afford it, then Jerry would be responsible for paying that. And so this concept of tithing, even though that has a sort of a religious connotation today um, was uh, an idea of collectively holding people responsible for, for debt and, and uh, what they would be responsible for together. Uh, you know, oath helpers, another term from uh, long ago uh, in that, that uh, pre-11th century or 11th century era, um, you had people who would verify uh, on their oath, on their sworn allegiance to the king or whatever, that what the what the what person claims that the, that was testifying or the person who was charged to be guilty was something that you know they could say this person is innocent and I swear on my oath that they are innocent. Uh, people would step forward to do this and and uh, the oath helpers today we consider the background to this is a, what we call a jury today um, and so people are on their solemn oath to uphold the truth and, and verify what they believe to be the truth based on testimony and evidence that's presented in a trial. All of those have their roots in this old um, common law area of old England, that era. And again, more history for you. I apologize for this. For those of you who don't like history, I often say this in the class face to face. It's like those of you who are absolutely not fond of history, it's, this is your clue to, to go to sleep for a little bit. Um, again, I say it's important not to memorize the date, but to get a, a context for what we're talking about for our American legal system. So 1066, uh, we had the Battle of Hastings that happened. Uh, William the Conqueror, who was otherwise known as the Duke of Normandy, came over from um, France, and uh, the Normans and, and the French system was based on old um, law from the Roman Empire, empire uh, which is considered civil law. And in the civil law system, all things were written down. Um, let me put up the rest of this slide here. For, um, part of this anyway. Uh, the civil law system uh, was based on the um, uh, Justinian Code. Emperor Justinian decided that, uh, in, in old ancient Rome, decided that he would write down all the laws for the whole legal system and uh, put them all in volumes. And so the, under the civil law system, where do you look? You don't look at prior cases and customs. You go back and look in the book for the answer. For a, You have a case where somebody has a dispute today, go back and look in the volume to find out where it is. And that's a civil law system is based on looking at uh, primarily just at the civil um, code that was adopted. So the Duke of Normandy came when he came to England and, and at the Battle of Hastings, um, came along, basically he brought along these codes and the Roman civil law sort of system, and then he saw this common law system that they had, and since he won, typically you would say whoever the winning uh, ruler would be would change to whatever their system was, but uh, uh, William the Conqueror was a pretty wise guy, and basically he saw the value of common law and melded those two together, the civil law and common law system. And, uh, and then also he saw what was going on in England at the time was a, 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 a whole separate, uh, what we call canon law, separate system. Uh, the church courts, uh, church dealt with um, people when they were getting married, they would uh, have like a dowry, so people would hand over certain rights in land or certain things uh, in part of the marriage uh, when somebody died and things would get passed on. Uh, the church was involved in those um, types of, of issues. And so really there's uh, a common law, a civil law, and canon law that, that pretty much got melded under this old English um, time period. Okay. Again, roots, uh, we, we have our common law roots uh, uh, come, have come from this period. We don't really have a formal church law anymore, um, but the uh, roots of our, our system were from that. And uh, I'll explain how our civil law has been adopted too, because we have uh, civil law today where we do look at statutes and we apply them in our cases, uh, but judges, uh, when they make decisions uh, at the appellate level, uh, look at cases that have come before to make their decision, which, of course, cases that have come before now are in uh, books, uh, they're published in volumes and, and online, and so you're looking at a written form, but you're looking at the prior case decision and applying that to the current case decision, and you're looking at civil law in the set sense of the, like the old Roman system. Uh, we're looking at statutes and that sort of thing. So that's kind of how our mix of our system works today. 
All right, last slide on history. So um, again, if you look at this and you want, um, this is in, let's see, I'll give you the year, uh, 1215, um, outside of what is now today London, uh, on a, a plain there, you had an area called Runnymede, and um, at the time, King John was a, um, a, a ruthless king, and a bunch of lords said that they had enough of this king, and so they rode out on this plain um, and met uh, King John, and they handed him this thing called the Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta, um, which means Great Charter, as you see, um, basically said, uh, King, you know, you uh, get your powers derived from us. Ultimately, it's not just you're in charge of everything, and so you need to answer to us and, and uh, be responsible to uh, the people. And uh, the king, of course, is like, well, what if I don't follow this thing? And they said, well, we'll kill you. So, of course, he signed this, and then he rode off in the sunset and abided by some of the things and, and um, not other things. But the really important part of this and why you even see this slide is because it, this is basically the basis of our entire U.S. Constitution. Um, the Constitution is about power and power that's uh, and trying to... Um, not have power uh, too much in one area of, of the system, uh, particularly in this at this time frame, 1215. It's like uh, it's the first time you had anybody who challenged the king and said that you were not in charge. The kings usually had their way prior to this, and uh, so uh, to have uh, a group of people, even though it's not the people generally, it wasn't the serfs. It was well um, interested land uh, land owning uh, lords and barons that that challenged the king. It was it set the stage for. Um, what became our constitution later on, where, where we try to limit the power of the king, or now the president, um, uh, and trying to, to disperse that power out instead of have it all in one one place. So that's the importance of the uh, Magna Carta. Right. So uh, let me get to this uh, as our last slide for this first part for you. And uh, this is another aspect of of uh, of. Uh, you know, flashing forward from 1215 to 1329, but another aspect of uh, introducing the legal system to you. And, and uh, <laughs> this case is kind of interesting. You had a, a it sounds like a bad joke uh, to start, but you had a, a guy who uh, went to the eye doctor. He went to get his, his eye examined. And uh, this is the, the dress, the type of clothing the oculist on the left here would have worn in those days. And the picture on the right is an actual wood block from this, this time period of wood carving, which was, I think, actually done... See if I had a date on this, 1306 or so they say somewhere in that that era. So um, pretty close to the time frame of the the actual case we're going to talk about. So the guy goes to the eye doctor and um, ends up um, being blinded by what the doctor did. So uh, uh, and and the question here is, uh, you know, there weren't really lawyers in this day, but there's somebody who represented the the um, the the um, person who was injured and uh, brought the case before. The, the equivalent of a court in those days, and uh, and the case was brought in trespass, and the trespass might sound very odd to you these days, and uh, you know in this time frame, is, uh, why would you why would somebody why would you bring this case on trespass, and and the idea was this person trespassed on the on you know on the eye of of the the victim, the patient, and. Um, trespass typically you think of somebody coming on your land without your permission and and uh, so uh, the um, defendant the the person who's acting as attorney for the the uh, the physician basically said you know uh, this case your honor is brought improperly and you should dismiss it because if anything this is a a covenant or a promise that was broken it wasn't a trespass and so you need to basically dismiss this case so the judge looked at it, and the judge um, essentially basically said, asked the victim, um, the, the patient, did you choose to go to the oculist? And the, the patient said, of course I did, but I didn't expect to be blinded. Um, when the judge then asked, but, the, but did this person deliberately harm you? Did they try to harm you in any way? And you know, as far as anyone could tell, and as far as the patient could tell, no, it wasn't deliberate. And so, um, while today we would consider this to be professional malpractice, the doctor maybe didn't uh, do what uh, he was supposed to do, uh, acted improperly. Uh, in those days, uh, you know, basically what the judge said, well, there wasn't any, you went to this doctor on your own choice. The doctor didn't purposely try to harm you. And uh, let me see, there was a case that was decided like this not long ago where actually somebody, somebody died, but it wasn't... Um, 
uh, purposeful and the person chose to go to that doctor. And in that case, there wasn't any liability. So the judge looked at this prior case that was similar to the facts of this case and said there shouldn't be liability here either because you chose to go here and the person didn't do it deliberately. So um, basically it was the idea of what's called the precedent where you look at a preceding case and um, and judge it uh, based on if it's like the similar to the facts that you have here, then you would do that. And, and that's what this case essentially stands for. Um, it's the uh, uh, idea of precedent, uh, deciding a case today based on a case that was similar to one that happened in the past. And uh, while our law has evolved and we would put more reliability on the hands of the doctor these days, in those days it wasn't, so they uh, applied the, the case in a similar manner. This is, again, uh, old English law that's, that's very much like our, our law, our legal system today. I'll leave you with that. That's part one, and we'll pick up part two. Please note that the uh, early part of part two, I think about three minutes or so into the, into the uh, lecture, there's a, a funky sort of a, a speed of integrity that, that isn't there, but just bear with it. It'll catch up again um, after, a, after a, a, a minute or so, and it, it, it works itself out. But I apologize for that one, one chunk of it. So that's it for today on this, and uh, um, we will call a day, and we'll pick up on the next part. Okay, thank you.